All right. Well, welcome back to Physics 272. You have, I know, I feel the same way. You have survived your first exam. You guys okay? No. Yeah. No? Okay. All right. So, first exam happened. I, that's all right. I don't mind. I can take it. It's okay. If I ask it, I can take it. Okay. So, here's the thing. The next exam is going to be harder, so start studying now, okay? All right, so we are learning about magnetic fields. And here are the key ideas in Chapter 18. This is straight out of your text, the key ideas in Chapter 18. So a moving charged particle makes a magnetic field. And the magnetic field is a different concept from the electric field, okay? And uh, it turns out that later on, Einstein's going to tell us that they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. But when you're measuring them in the lab, they appear as distinct entities. So the magnetic field appears distinctly from the electric field. And so a magnetic field can be produced either by a permanent magnet or by a moving charged particle. And when you have a compass, OK, the compass can't tell the difference. So the compass responds to the sum total of the magnetic field in that region in space. It doesn't care whether it came from a moving charged particle or from a permanent magnet or from a magnetic duct or the Earth's magnetic field. All of those things contribute together to give you the net magnetic field. And that's what the compass needle responds to. A current, we're going to talk about current today and how current is a continuous flow of charge. You know, and so think in that case of like, uh, rather than say a single person walking by and you track the person, think of a crowd going down a hallway, okay? And if there's a crowd going down a hallway, if it's a large enough crowd, you quit tracking individual people and saying, oh, there's Jane, there's Jeff, there's so-and-so. You just say, oh, there's a crowd of people moving by. That's the, the case of continuous current. The electron current will define as the number of electrons per second. Conventional current, we will see, uh, is when uh, we pretend that the current is carried by positively charged particles. And we'll see what, what we mean by that. Now, last time, we talked about the energy stored in a field. We saw that an electric field, just by virtue of existing, has an energy density in it. And then we saw that, if we set things up correctly, we could convert that energy stored in the electric field, we could convert it into work and finally into kinetic energy. We did that by letting um, two charged plates smack into each other. When the two charged plates were far apart, there was an electric field between them. They were storing energy in that electric field. When we let one of the plates go, it smack, slammed into the other one. And so we converted the energy in the electric field into the kinetic energy of those plates moving together. Uh, we also saw that there's a magnetic field um, due to moving charges. We had to introduce a cross product in order to calculate that. And for the cross product, you use your, your right hand, of course. And then uh, we had a little bit of time, I'll go over this again, to get the cross product mathematically. Today we're going to go through, uh, I guess I should ask you, are there any questions about last time before we go on? Okay. I think last lecture probably got more or less erased by the uh, exam having happened between now and then. So probably got more exam in your head at the moment than last lecture. All right, so that was last time. Today, we'll review those cross products mathematically. And also, we'll discuss the difference between electron current and conventional current. So conventional current is what everyone uses to calculate things. But it turns out that the, uh, the, the electrons are actually what really carries the current. So we'll calculate those guys. And then I have a little story time for you about true versus useful, all right? And we'll look at the Biot-Savart law in a wire. So to remind you where we've been, right? Way back Wednesday, uh, the last lecture, we, we talked about the Biot-Savart law for the magnetic field that a moving charged particle makes, right? A moving particle doesn't necessarily make a magnetic field unless it has a charge Q associated with it. And then it leaves a magnetic field. And the magnetic field has this form. Mu over four, mu naught over four pi is just to get the, the units correct. Uh, Q, V cross R hat over R squared. That's the form of that law, where V is the velocity of the particle, all right, relative to some observation point. And R is a vector that goes from the point charge to the observation point. And remember, the way, you know, the way to remember which way R points is R points to me. So there's some charged particle out there. If I want to know the magnetic field at a particular observation point, I imagine myself standing at the observation point, And then I remember that R points to me. So from the charged particle to me, that's the direction that R points. 
So here's that. Now we had to take a cross product to get that. We needed V cross R hat. And the way to take a cross product, well, we're going to do it mathematically, but you can figure out which direction it goes by using the right hand rule. Remember to use your right hand, not your left hand. And I told you you could do this if you forgot which is your right hand. This is your left hand spells out L. This doesn't help you if you're dyslexic, I'm sorry. But la, L, and then right hand, OK? So the right hand is, is the one that doesn't have an L on it. Um, so to get the cross product, what you do is that if I want to take the cross product of two vectors, uh, in this case, A cross B, point my hand parallel to A, curl my fingers in the direction of B, and then my thumb points in the direction of A cross B. All right? Now remember that the final vector is perpendicular to the first two. Right? Any two vectors pointing in any direction define a plane. Right? Two vectors make a plane, all right? unless they happen to coincide. All right? But if two vectors pointing in different directions define a plane, the cross product points perpendicular to that plane. What do you think is going to happen to my cross product, by the way, if I needed to have V cross R and V and R are parallel? Yeah, it's 0, right? And another way to think of that is, well, I can't define a perpendicular direction. So this is breaking down in multiple ways, right? So if V and R coincide, then uh, the cross product is 0. And the result, right, the result of the cross product is perpendicular to both V and R, um, and it points in the direction of the right hand rule. Here's the math, OK? And we saw that we could use uh, a shorthand for this math in terms of the determinant of a matrix, if you set the matrix up to look like this. So let me say that I have two vectors, A and B, and I want to take their cross product. I set up a 3x3 three three determinant of a matrix, where I put x hat, y hat, and z hat up top. In the next row, I put the components of the first vector, AX, AY, and AZ. In the third row, I put the components of the second vector, BX, BY, and BZ, and now you take a determinant in whatever way you like. Okay? Here's how I like to take a determinant. You may have your own method. All right? So I copy the first two columns down, and then I draw diagonal arrows on this thing. So I'm going to uh, set, set the problem up, because I'll get some answers that are positive and some that are negative, and some that are in the x hat, y hat, and z direction. And then I draw these diagonal arrows. So first I draw diagonal arrows down and to the right. Anything that an arrow catches goes over here. So I have x hat times a y times b z. Those get multiplied together with a plus sign. And I put them over here in the math, a y times b z. And I'm putting that in the x hat spot that I already set up. Okay? This down into the right arrow here picks up the y hat, the az, and the bx. So I'll get az times bx. And I put that right there in the y hat direction. Okay? Do you have any questions about how that's going so far? Okay? All right. If you guys know of like a really quick, slicker method, you can tell me after class. Um, so up and to the right is going to get a minus sign. So this guy grabs a bx, ay, and it's in the z hat direction. So I'll take a bx times ay with a minus sign right here in the z hat direction. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? That's just how I take a cross product. You might have your own method. Okay. And then that all together sets up the answer here mathematically. Here I just converted it into the vector notation that your book uses. And the resulting vector has a particular magnitude. The magnitude of A cross B is the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine theta. Okay? So now we have another way to tell that the cross product of two parallel vectors um, goes away if they're actually, you know, if they're parallel, right? So if I think about, well, what's the magnitude of this cross product? The farther apart these vectors point, right, the larger sine theta gets, right? And then when these guys get closer and closer together, sine theta goes down, sine theta goes down. And when theta is 0, sine is what? Sine of 0 is 0, right? So when, the guy, when they coincide, I get, no, I get a 0 for the cross product. Okay. Questions about that? OK. All right. Now, current. All right. Uh, we talked about the Biot-Savart law for a single charged particle that's moving. But really, how often do we have that, right? We tend to have things in wires moving around. And then we're going to get a whole bunch of charged particles moving by. We need to know how to calculate in terms of those situations <laughs> where we don't talk in terms of individual particles. We simply say, look, there's a current running through this wire, right? So the electron current uh, and the conventional current are a little bit different. So let me tell you the, the difference. Um, the real physical thing in a, in a circuit is that the electrons move. So let's hook up a battery to a light bulb. I've updated the slides. 
so that the light bulbs are no longer those old school energy hogs known as incandescent bulbs, but we have compact fluorescent bulbs to be energy efficient. Now really the real future is LEDs, okay? So if you're really cool, you have LED light bulbs, all right? So here I have a circuit with uh, the, the battery and the, uh, the light bulb hooked up by wires. So what physically happens in this is that electrons actually pop off the negative terminal of the battery, okay? And move around, go through the light bulb and light it up, and then they pop, pop back into the positive terminal of the battery, okay? So that's what electron current is, and that's the real physical thing that's moving, all right? Here's the thing. The world calculates all this stuff in terms of conventional current. Like if you've done any circuit analysis so far, you used something called conventional current. And in conventional current, we do the following. We say, let's pretend that rather than being carried by electrons, let's pretend that current is carried by positive particles. Okay? So what would it look like if we had positive particles moving around that circuit, creating the same effects? All we have to do is send those fictitious positive particles in the opposite direction. Okay? So if we send those fictitious particles in the opposite direction, now it all physically works. So in conventional current, we pretend there's a positive charge, doesn't exist, it's a figment of our imagination, and that this current is carried by a positive particle that pop, pops off the top, runs around, lights, off the light, lights up the light bulb, and comes back in the negative terminal. Okay? Why is there this difference? You can blame this guy. All right? So when Ben Franklin uh, was discovering these effects, he guessed that the current was carried by positive particles. He just didn't know, okay? So he was just learning things and just figuring things out. And so it's his fault. But now that it's there, we have to work in terms of the same convention. And actually, there are some advantages to using this convention anyway, because it's easier to think in terms of positive particles running around. There's one less minus sign to take into account, into account okay? So now we talk in terms of conventional current. Are there any questions so far? All right, there's another difference between electron current and conventional current, and that's in the units. So electron current is in terms of electrons per second directly. It's just how many electrons per second are passing by this point. Now, conventional current, not only does conventional current run in the opposite direction, because we pretend it's carried by positively charged particles, which move in the opposite direction to the electrons, but we also then change the units to coulombs per second. So it's in terms of charge per per unit time. So the way to convert then from number of particles per time to charge per time is to multiply every particle by the charge it carries. And the charge a particle carries is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So that's the only difference between these guys. All right. Now, the square brackets up here just mean units. So electron current is in terms of electrons per second. Conventional current with the capital I is in terms of coulombs per second or sometimes called an ampere or an amp. So if you've heard of currents and amps, that's what it is. It's coulombs per second. Any questions so far? All right. And now the mathematicians in the room are getting uncomfortable because I've used their favorite letter, little i. Right? And the, the, the letter little i here is meaning electrons per second, but mathematicians like to use it for the square root of minus 1. And uh, apologies to the mathematicians. There just aren't enough symbols in the world to discuss all the little things that we need. So sometimes a symbol has to do double duty. We're going to show this one, by the way. What we're going to do next is calculate from the idea of individual particles moving by, calculate the electron current in these terms. N, A, V, and I'll tell you what those mean, OK? The little n is number of electrons per unit volume. A is the cross-sectional area, and V is the velocity. But we're going to build that up. So here's what those terms mean, little n density of electrons in the wire, electrons per unit volume. And this is something that you just look up from the material. So if you've got a wire that's made of copper, it's got a particular number of free electrons per unit volume available to carry current. If you've got a silver wire, it's going to have a different number of free electrons per unit volume available to carry current. So you just look that up for the material you're given. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire, so these wires down here. The cross-sectional area would be if I chop off the end and I look at that cross-sectional area there. So this depends on the geometry of the wire. If you have a thick wire, you have a large cross-sectional area. If you have a thin wire, you have a smaller cross-sectional area. So which one carries more current, the thick wire or the skinny wire? Which one can carry more current? Thick wire, OK? So it makes sense then that this area should show up. 
V is the average velocity of electrons in the wire, so meters per second. And that is going to depend on the conditions under which you're doing things. It'll depend on how you set up the circuit, what's the voltage you've got across things, and all that. So that's the average velocity. Now, what we're trying to do is just build up electron current in terms of things that um, are, are reasonable parameters in the problem. All right. So here, let's calculate the electron current in terms of this little n, which is number of electrons per volume. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire. V bar is the average velocity of electrons in that material. So first, I just want to take a chunk of wire. So here's a chunk of wire. We're going to imagine it's a part of a larger wire that's carrying a bunch of current. But I'm just going to look at this chunk for now. So how many electrons do we expect to be in this chunk of wire? I've got a little segment of length L and cross-sectional area A. And I'm approximating it, approximating it as a, you know, I, well, I drew the diagram as a cylinder, right? But you know, for whatever area you have over here, it could be cylindrical or not. It doesn't matter. But the volume of this guy, what's the volume of this little chunk? L and I have a cross-sectional area A. What's the volume of that guy? Yeah, A times L. Okay, It could be for any, sh any shape of, of A that you like. So that's the total volume there. So if I want to know how many electrons are in here, I just need to know the density of electrons, electrons per unit volume, and multiply by this volume. Now I know how many electrons are in that spot. So number of electrons is density times volume. And the square brackets, again, mean units. So that gives me numbers per meter cubed times meter cubed. And all of that together equals number. So I got the units right. So then all together, you told me that volume is AL. So then the number of electrons in this chunk of material is little n times A times L. So far, so good? All right. So now I'm going to let the electrons move. Let's let it carry some current. And they're going to move at velocity v. What I want to know is I have that chunk of, of electrons, and I'm going to move that chunk of electrons into the next section of wire. Okay? So there's one long wire. I'm going to take the chunk of electrons and move it into the next section. As I do that, there's a certain number of electrons that pass through that cross-sectional area A. They just pass through. All right? And I want to know how long it took. So this is the number of electrons that are going to pass through. Okay? I want to know now how long did it take that chunk of electrons to pass through that cross-sectional area. So how long it takes is I use distance equals rate times time. So there's some distance they move, L. Uh, the rate is the average velocity of the electrons. And time is what we're trying to figure out is how long did that take. So now I solve for delta T. That's L over V. And, if, and you know, do the units check real quick. Well, L over V is going to give me meters divided by meters per second. The meters cancel. The second comes up top. So I do get something that's in the right units. Right? So watch these boxes. They'll, they'll appear on the next slide. So I have now number of electrons in that volume. I have the time delta t that it took for that chunk of electrons to pass through the cross-sectional area. And now I want to know how many electrons pass by per second. Okay? So I simply take the number of electrons divided by the time it takes them to pass by. So I have that already up here. Number of electrons, we said, was little n a l. That's getting written down here. Delta t, we said, was l over v. The l's cancel. The v comes up top. And I have little n a v. And all together, then, that should give me number of electrons per second passing by. All right. Now I'm going to check the units, because this is the formula we wanted to derive. We wanted to derive that electron current is little a sorry, little n times a times v. But it's not terribly obvious what the units are. So let me check it real quick, make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Uh, number density is number per unit volume. Area, a, is meters squared. Velocity is meters per second. So I get a meter times meters squared divided by meters cubed. Those cancel. OK? And then all together, I get numbers per second. So it's working. Do you have any questions about that? OK? Does that mean we're good? All right? OK. I'm getting some. All right. So this is what we just showed. We showed, OK, if we're going to talk in terms of electron current, little i, then we can write that as little n times a v, where little n is the number of electrons per unit volume that are available to carry current in that material. So we showed that one. To get conventional current, we take uh, this number and multiply it by charge. OK? And the charge here, then, is uh, well, it's the charge that the, the 
particles are carrying, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So the conventional current then will get us coulombs per second. Okay, if this was particles per second, this is coulombs per second or amps. Okay, any questions so far? Good. All right. Okay, story time. Story time. All right. Has anybody been hot air ballooning? Anybody? Oh, yeah, i got to go hot air ballooning. Of course, I say that I've never actually been. I've been up in a balloon that was, um, would you believe I actually took a ride in a helium balloon? All right, yeah, exactly. There was this park that had a big helium balloon. And anyway, it was tethered, so we didn't float away and stuff like that. But uh, that was quite exciting. So anyway, someday I'd like to take a ride in a hot air balloon. So here's how a hot air balloon works, all right? There's fire involved, right? OK, so basically you have fire that controls how hot the balloon is. When you make the, uh, the air in the balloon warmer, it expands, and then the balloon floats up. If you let it cool off, then the balloon deflates a little bit, and then the, the balloon sinks down a little bit. So all right, so now story time. Two physicists are in a hot air balloon, all right? Two physicists in a hot air balloon, there's fire involved, so they're having fun, and they're playing with the controls. And of course, when they make it hotter, the balloon goes up, and when they make it, you know, let it cool off a little bit, the balloon goes down. Now, you can't really steal a, steer a hot air balloon, right? There's no steering wheel on these things. All you get to do is control up or down, and what you're doing is counting on air currents to carry you in different directions. So when you move up, the air currents go one way, you move down, they go another. So these physicists are playing with the controls. They go up, they get carried one direction, they float down, they get carried another, and pretty soon they figure out, wait a minute, we've been up here a while, and we have no idea where we are. All right, so they're totally lost because they were playing with fire. So they notice, though, that they're about to pass over a mountain. So they're coming close to the mountain, and they see, oh, thank goodness, there's somebody at the top of the mountain. All right, so they yell down, hey, hey, we're up here, we're up here, hey, hey, where are we? All right, so the person on top of the mountain kind of looks down, scribbles in the ground for a little bit. And they're waiting for their answer and waiting for their answer. And they're getting, they're drifting away. Like, Where are we? Where are we? They're drifting away. And, and they're almost out of earshot when the person on top of the mountain yells, you're in a hot air balloon. And they drift away. <sighs> so one physicist says to the other physicist, that was a mathematician. Oh, really? How do you know that? I'll hear from the mathematicians after class here. OK, how do you know that? Well, what they said was <laughs> completely correct, all right? They took a really long time to answer, right? And even though what they said was completely correct, it was useless. All right. <laughs> Mathematicians, come talk to me later, and I'll tell you the opposite joke. All right. So here's the deal. Sometimes things are true and correct and don't really help us along what we need, OK? Sometimes something is not quite true and correct, but it's really useful. So in the case of electron current versus conventional current, we use the conventional current, all right? We pretend, we, we just make this up, we pretend that the current is actually carried by positive charges moving around the circuit. Not true, it's really electrons moving around. It's just that it's much more useful to talk in terms of those positive, fictitious particles that we make up. So conventional current isn't quite true, all right? But it's actually useful. So we're going to go ahead with the conventional current and think in terms of those. Not only is it the same way that everyone else calculates it, but it's also easier on us physically because we don't have to have the minus sign in our head. You have a question? Um, is, current is what? Is current oh, good question. Okay, so the question is: Is current a scalar or a vector? Okay, excellent. I love these questions. Um, conventional current is defined as a scalar. Now you're right. There's a direction present. So we should be thinking in terms of direction. And in fact, in order to calculate the magnetic field coming off of current, what we're going to have to know is locally which direction is it going. So we're going to put that vector, the, the direction, we're going to put that in the physical wire itself and say that the current, the, the, the wire is carrying a current, and I can move the wire around and the current won't change. Okay, So that's why we keep the current a scalar but the direction of the wire could change. So we'll tie that direction to the wire. Does that make sense? But you could, you could imagine reformulating the equations in terms of a vector current. Okay, and sometimes we do that. But for conventional current, we're going to leave it as a scalar. Does that make sense? Yeah? Excellent question. All right. Any other comments so far? Other than the mathematicians I offended who will come talk to me after class. I love math, by the way. It's basically what I do for a living. I'm a theoretical physicist, so I do lots of math. All right. Um, 
here's what we had so far. We had the Bios of our law for a point charge. Um, and remember how that went. Now, we want to generalize this okay, from the point charge case where we have Q times QV cross R hat. We need it in terms of an actual current carrying wire. All right? So if I have a little current carrying wire, I'll have a current I running through it. And I need to know then what's the magnetic field that that little piece of wire puts out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to convert our law for the point charge into a law for the current in a wire. So if I just look at these equations, they're very similar, right? The point charge equation was that the magnetic field from the point charge is mu naught over 4 pi qv cross r hat divided by r squared. The Bios of our law, the same law for current in a wire, looks very similar. It's mu naught over 4 pi i times delta L cross r hat over r squared. And this here answers the question you just asked, which is where's the vector here? Here's the current as a scalar, and delta L we let have the, the vector dependence. Okay? So look at these two equations, though. They're very similar, <clears throat> as they should be. right? We just want to convert from a single particle moving by to now I have a whole chunk of wire with so many particles going by that I count it in terms of current and not individual particles anymore. Looks very similar. There's the same factor of mu naught over 4 pi in both equations. Okay, there's something cross r hat divided by r squared. The only difference is that whereas I had qv for the point charge, I now have i delta l. So we need to figure out how to convert from qv to i delta l in this case of a bunch of particles moving by. So the goal here in this slide is to show how qv turns into i delta l in the case of a large uh, chunk of wire. So for the point charge, it's just QV. Okay? Now think about, rather than one point charge, think of many point charges going by. All right? So many that it gets hard to count. But I could think of n point charges, where n is the number of particles. And then I would just convert this QV into nQV, where big N is the number of particles. Okay? But if I'm given a hunk of material, I may not know the number of particles. right? I would simply know, well, in this material, copper, for example, there's a certain number of electrons per unit volume. So that's something I can know. And then I could think of a piece of the wire, and I'd know how much wire I have. <clears throat> From that, I can get the number of particles in that spot, right? So I, would, I could get, then, little n, number of particles per unit volume, right? And then if I multiply that by volume, I should get back the number of particles. So little n times delta v gives me then number of particles. <clears throat> Questions so far? All right. Now, in the chunk of wire, all right, so I'm going to take a little chunk of wire, I'm imagining it's part of a larger wire, but I'm going to just take this chunk for now. In this little chunk of wire, I have a particular current going through a, a length delta l. All right. And so what I've done here so far is I've just rewritten this. I have a little q. I have a V for velocity, little n is density of electrons, and delta V is the volume of this chunk of wire. Now I need to rewrite the volume in terms of the geometry of the wire. Well, in the wire, I have a cross-sectional area A, and then times the length delta L of just this segment of wire. We'll take the wire segment by segment. So the, vo the volume of this chunk is A times delta L. All right. Now, here's the next thing I'm going to do. Right. I'm going to uh, move the vector symbol. That's all I'm going to do in the next stage. So right now I have a vector over the V. Right? V is the, uh, the vector velocity of this charge going by. All right? So I'm going to move this vector symbol over to the delta L because the delta L is about the geometry of the wire. And as I move the wire, it drags the velocity with it. Right? Okay? So I could put this vector symbol either spot, and it will work. But it will work just as well to put it on top of the delta L. So I just move the vector symbol. That's all I did in that step. Okay? Does, does that make sense, though, that I, I changed the direction of the wire and I automatically changed the direction of the, elect of the particles flowing through? So now I have Q, V, and A. And if I look at that, gosh, that's a familiar looking set of, of uh, variables. I already know that the conventional current is Q, N, A, V, which is right here. So that actually is the conventional current. Just draw a little box around that and say, look, what we've gotten so far is I times delta L. <clears throat> so this is how you go from a single point charge, which is in terms of QV, that same thing in the case of a chunk of wire becomes I delta L. All right? Do you have any questions about that? All right? 
Good. So that shows us how these guys are related. That the Bio Savar law for a point charge turns into the Bio Savar law for current in a wire because QV becomes I delta L. All right. Okay. So now, now let's think a little bit more deeply about these equations here. All right. I have, in order to calculate the magnetic field of either a point charge going by or of current going by, I need to measure. Uh, I, I can measure the magnetic field, but I can also calculate it by having measured the velocities, right? I could measure the velocity of the point charge, and I'd know what the magnetic field is I should measure. Or I could measure the current in the wire, and I'd know the magnetic field that I should measure, all right? But let's think about this. We've told you before, all right, in your, in your previous physics class, Physics 172, or the class you had before this, um, that the laws of physics are the same in any reference frame, okay? So in any, in any frame of reference, the laws of physics are the same. And a frame of reference is just defined as, as something that's not a, a, a place where you're measuring things and you're not currently undergoing acceleration. So if you're moving at some constant velocity, then you're in a good frame of reference. Now, in any frame of reference, this is the Bios of our law. For the velocity I measure, I'll measure this magnetic field. But here's the weird thing, OK? Let's, let's, uh, let's take this very seriously, that the laws of physics are the same in any reference frame, OK? You could measure the magnetic field coming off of a wire here in this room. And then I could measure it. Let's say that, let's say that I take this wire now, and I'm going to do it in a lab. And my lab, <laughs> my lab is going to be on wheels. So I'm going to put my lab on a train, and my lab's going to be going by, all right? I'm going to measure this wire. I'm going to bring the wire with me on the train, all right? And we're going to run a current through the wire. I'm going to measure the current in the wire, and I'm going to measure the magnetic field coming off. You're going to measure, from your frame of reference, the current in the wire. Okay? But think back. Current is ultimately about particles moving at a particular velocity. So if we think back to the point particle description, if I have a point particle of charge moving at a particular velocity, right? I've got, I've got the point particle with me on my moving laboratory train that goes by, and I measure a particular velocity of it relative to me, but do you measure the same velocity relative to you? No. Okay, so we measure different velocities, right? We're in different frames of reference. We measure different velocities. So look back up at the equation for magnetic field. When I measure the magnetic field of this particle that's moving relative to me, and I'm on the train, and you measure the magnetic field of this particle that's moving relative to you, and you're not on the train, do we measure the same magnetic field? No. Really weird, huh? OK? So the magnetic field that you measure actually depends on your frame of reference. But it's in the same, uh, it's, it's for the same reason that uh, velocity depends on your frame of reference. OK? So the Biot-Savar law, the law, works in any frame of reference. It's just that you have to be self-consistent. And if you measure the velocity in a particular frame of reference, you need to be in the same frame of reference to measure the magnetic field. Okay? But uh, you know, this ultimately means right, that if you had a compass in your hand and you were a fast enough runner, right, you, you, it would affect the, ma the magnetic field that your compass is, is detecting. Do you have any questions about that? It's a bit weird. It's kind of strange. But you know, here's another. Here's another way to think about it. Is anybody in here a, a runner? I, I used to run cross country, and I was so bad at it. I was last all the time, so I'm not a runner. Even though I was on an actual, you know, college cross country team, I came in so last all the time that I just quit. Anyway, so I don't like running. But you guys like running, okay? So, so let's take our fastest runner in the class, all right? And let's have this particle moving by, all right? Well, let's let our fastest runner in the class catch up to the to the particle. When you catch up to the particle and you're moving at exactly the same speed as it, you measure zero relative velocity and you measure zero magnetic field. So if you're moving fast enough relative to these particles, you can get yourself into a frame of reference where you don't even detect the magnetic field. All right, so it does depend on, uh, on your frame of reference. Do you have any questions about that? Kind of weird, but kind of fun. All right. so. Um, it turns out, actually, that this is actually, if you're interested in this connection, this actually has to do with special relativity, right? Anytime we talk ultimately about the frames of references and the, the, 
measuring velocities in different frames of ref references, uh, relativity is going to come up. And it turns out that there's actually a deep connection between electric field and magnetic field. It's like they're two sides of the same coin. In any lab, you measure a particular electric field and a particular magnetic field. But then in a different frame of reference, it's like the coin twists a little bit. And you get a little bit different ratio that you measure. So it's, it actually goes back to the special theory of relativity. Now, there's another issue with this equation. Okay, so, so far we saw that the Biot-Savart law depends on your pr frame of reference. Right? And it's because there's a velocity in there, and velocity depends on your frame of reference. Here's another thing we need to think about with this. What happens if I suddenly change the current in a wire? Okay, so let's all be in the same frame of reference again, and we have a wire running by. Let's say at first it's got no current, and then bam, we flick a switch, and we've got current running through it. According to this equation, we immediately, instantaneously have a magnetic field throughout all of space. All right? Now, how fast can things propagate? What's the ultimate highest speed that any physical object in the universe can go? Speed of light, OK? So nothing can, prop can go faster than the speed of light. This actually applies also to our fields. So the electric field is a real physical object. The magnetic field is a real physical object. And when I turn on this current, OK, the fact that there's a magnetic field being generated, that magnetic field itself is not going to, bam, instantaneously be all throughout the universe. It's actually going to propagate at the speed of light and then fill all of space. Okay? So there's something not quite right about this equation, and that it doesn't include that time component. All right? So why is there no time in the Biot-Savart law? It's because it's actually an approximation. All right? And you know it's an approximation because of that problem of I flick the switch, immediately the current turns on, but it will take, uh, the magnetic field will propagate out in space at the speed of light. So this equation must be an approximation. Okay? Now, it's an equation we use a lot, so what are the circumstances under which we can use this equation? There's two circumstances, right? You need, you need two assumptions in here. First of all, that the velocities of the things you're measuring are small velocities compared to the speed of light. That's assumption number one. The other thing you agree to do is not measure the magnetic fields too quickly, OK? So I flick the switch, I turn on the currents, and as long as you don't check the magnetic field out in space any faster than that signal could propagate at the speed of light, we're OK. So those are the two assumptions. Uh, slow moving particles, slow compared to the speed of light, and we don't measure too quickly. Then the equation is going to give us um, correct answers. Do you have any questions about that piece? OK. Does that just no questions mean you're good, or no questions mean it's kind of weird? Right? OK. All right, looks like we're good. All right, that's good, because we're done a little bit early today. <laughs>